Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Edson. Uh, my day job is the Director of Web and New Media Strategy at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. I've worked there for 20 years. I started um, cleaning plexiglass in the Asian Art Museums, a uh, starving artist uh, looking for a good job, and I've been there ever since. Um, but I'm not here today as an official Smithsonian employee. I'm here as a private citizen because I believe very deeply in the importance of, of what you're doing, uh, and I want to help, even if in some small, modest way. Um, so note that I'm not a spokesperson for the Smithsonian. Even when I'm working, I'm not a spokesperson for the Smithsonian. Um, I'm not a policymaker. I'm a director of strategy, which means I wave my arms around and try and be persuasive and coherent. Um, I tweet at M. P. Edson, and uh, uh, this is really my uh, on SlideShare, the slide sharing site uh, is the nucleus of this presentation with links and uh, footnotes and annotations to try and spread the good stuff around. That's a, a, a screen capture of the SlideShare site and I want to just highlight um, really the core of this presentation is from a chapter I wrote for a book by the uh, American Association of Museums. Uh, and the paper's called Museums in the Commons, Helping Makers Get Stuff Done. So don't worry about taking notes or following links or anything. It's all there in the paper. Uh, another presentation that, that I've, I draw from for this talk today is a, a slideshow up on SlideShare called Prototyping the Smithsonian Commons that takes you through the whole epic saga and also uh, the, the paper called Imagining the Smithsonian Commons that goes through the strategy implications into, uh, into the vision. So, um, and lastly, I have no uh, presumption that I'm not saying anything up here that most of you haven't thought of before. Um, any of you could probably stand up on this stage and give this talk from your souls, uh, but maybe I'll say something in a way that is uh, new or helpful to you, something you already know, uh, or maybe I'll reflect back to you your own inspiring uh, acts and words and deeds in a way that's useful. So, um, there's something magical, something, something inspiring about people who are doing something. Someone who's making something, who's solving a problem, who's uh, leaning forward and getting difficult work done. There's a certain magic, a certain energy that captivates us, that's inspiring to us. Um, uh, these are not people taking a back seat in the culture. These are people who are getting stuff done. Uh, Barack Obama called these people the risk takers, the doers, the makers of things. And we sense very deeply as a culture that these people are important. They're very important. People doing things matters. It is these makers, these doers of things that may, our, our future as a species, the future of our planet may rely on the success of these makers, scientists, artists, creators of all kinds, educators. Uh, and the museums that we've built, at least in the States, the museums, the libraries, the archives, the cultural institutions are temples of the past accomplishments of people who have done things, who have created, who have, who have made. And yet, these institutions, libraries, museums, and archives can be very difficult places for people who want to do and make in the present or in the future. Great at reflecting the past glory of making. Not so great, very often, at supporting tomorrow's makers, tomorrow's innovators and creators. And we have 18,000 museums in the United States of America, give or take a few. Uh, the combined budget of these museums alone is $20.7 billion. That's, as we say in the States, that's a lot of scratch. That's a lot of money. That's more than the uh, annual gross domestic product of half the countries on Earth. And you would expect in return for that investment by society, you'd expect a lot of great things. A lot of support for the innovators, the problem solvers, the makers, the learners that we depend on as a culture. Um, but uh, uh, we, we have um, uh, museums as, we have vast collections of rare and notable physical and intellectual property, we have people with expertise in these institutions, we have know-how, we have curiosity and knowledge creation nurtured through, uh, through research, publication, exhibition, 
public programming. These are all things that this $20.7 billion does. We hold positions of trust in our communities, respect. We're heralded as places that, and uh, Roy Slade wrote this in an essay called Why Museums Matter, reflect creativity, history, culture, ideas, innovation, exploration, discovery, diversity, freedom of expression, and the ideals of democracy. You know, that's a great mission statement for this industry, this, this civic investment we call museums. But walk into any museum library archive in the country just about and ask these three questions. Can I get access to your collections and resources? It's a pretty fair question. Can I get the stuff? Are experts available to help me understand key ideas and concepts? And can I incorporate your collections and your resources into new products, ideas, innovations? Ask those three questions. So first, the access. Can I get the raw materials of knowledge creation, production, creativity? Expertise. Are the connectors, the guides, is the know-how available to me? Not just from your staff, your payroll, but from your extended network and community. And finally, reuse. Once I get the raw materials of knowledge creation and innovation, once I get access to people who can help me figure things out and connect, what can I do with it? Can I do something? That's the key question I want to focus on. Many makers, inventors, creators, artists, business people, expect the answer to those questions to be yes. Many museum employees, many library archive employees want the question, the answer to the question to be yes. Most of the public uh, expects the question to be yes. But very often, the question is either flat out no, or a very, very highly qualified and nuanced no. Um, we uh, developed a prototype for a commons, uh, a, a, a sort of a series of movies about what a Smithsonian commons would look like, and I'll show you a little clip from that at the end. And we put that up on a wiki uh, website, and we asked for public comment. We got 1,200 comments, over 70,000 words of public input on this concept. And this is a very, one of those comments. It's a very interesting one. Um, the, the commenter said, one of my biggest gripes doing presentations for the public on archaeology is the number of museums that do not have their collections online. Much is kept hidden away for researchers, researchers only. We can read journal articles on, on valuable exhibits, and sometimes a few drawings are available. But anything else requires either a visit or an application to do scholarly research. That is not fair to the public, since they pay either directly or indirectly for the valuable items kept for a limited number of people. Further, many people cannot travel or will never travel to see some more distant institutions. I am hoping for the day when all museums, small and large, put their collections on online for the benefit of schools, colleges, and the general public. That's a real comment we received from someone in the public, and it resonates. All of you, I think, know and believe those things, but real people who matter, citizens, taxpayers, think this is true. But most of our institutions just haven't grown up thinking about these kinds of people. People with those sorts of digital needs and assumptions didn't exist 20 years ago. I, when I started my job, the web didn't exist 20 years ago when I started my job. These are new reflexes for institutions to think about, helping people get stuff done with digital tools. And I think the, the milieu, the environment that these people are growing up in, that a college graduate is coming into the workforce with, presumes our understanding of a few key concepts. The long tail, I'm going to go through these qu uh, quickly, the long tail, uh, Chris Anderson describing global audiences forming around niche interests. Joy's Law, no matter what business you're in, most of the smart people work for someone else. Cognitive Surplus, uh, Clay Shirky's idea that there are a trillion hours a year available among the internet-connected, educated world that can be used for a higher purpose. Moore's Law, I'll go through quickly. And then Kathy Sierra, who says, uh, your users are heroes in their own epic journeys and your job as an institution is to help them to succeed, help support their epic journeys through life, not be an obstacle, or she says, using a Tolkien reference, an orc. So these are the presets. If you were starting an institution today, 
the Smithsonian Institution was started 167 years ago, you would start with these presets. We started with the idea that you would come and visit a physical bricks and mortar institution. If you were starting an institution today in a digitally connected world, you'd have a different set of assumptions about what your job was. Our job at the Smithsonian, and this is the Smithsonian Secretary G. Wayne Clough, who defined a strategic plan in February last year, he says our job in society is to advance four grand challenges. Unlocking the mysteries of the universe, understanding and sustaining a biodiverse planet, valuing world cultures, and understanding the American experience. That's a pretty audacious vision. I mean, we've been working on understanding the American experience for over 200 years, and we're not very far along with the task. I can tell you, it's a big vision. It's a vision worthy of the Smithsonian Institution. Similar kinds of visions are worthy of the trust and investment that the public gives you every year in your institutions. How do you get that work done in a digital age? It's by supporting makers, supporting doers through a commons. I think ultimately, what is a commons? It is, we hope, a very powerful model for getting stuff done. So, abstractly, a commons is a set of resources maintained in the public sphere for the benefit and use of everyone. Typically, a commons gets created when a property owner decides that a given set of resources, uh, grass for grazing sheep, forest for parkland, software code, intellectual property patents, a property owner decides that a given set of resources will be more valuable to them if freely shared than if restricted. In the law and in the way we understand the world works, we recognize that no idea stands alone and that all ideas, creativity, innovation is built on the ideas, creativity, and innovations of others. When educators, business people, artists, scientists, when everyone has unrestricted access to the work of others, then knowledge and creativity and innovation can flourish. Conversely, unnecessarily restricted content is a barrier to innovation. If you can't find an idea, which you often can't on our websites, mine and yours, if you can't find an idea, if you can't ascertain its context, if you can't take that idea and add value to it by sharing it with your social network, however you define that, if you can't get legal permission to take that idea or that resource and build it into something new, then innovation suffers. Unnecessarily restricted content is like a virus that spreads through the internet, making the intellectual property provenance of each generation of new ideas less and less clear. That's not a way to build a new Europe. It's not a way to build a new United States of America. Increasingly, I think of a commons in positive terms as a kind of organized workshop where the raw materials of knowledge can be found and assembled into new things. So, how do you make a commons? I think uh, after, after pondering this for a while and looking at uh, inspiring examples, I think there are 12 basic pieces of a commons. You don't have to do them all, but you do a lot of them. When you do enough of them together, you start to get surprising and beneficial things happening. So here's the 12-part design pattern for a commons. First, federated, bring things together. This is the Smithsonian Collection Search Center, which has, oh, I'm spacing on the number of millions of items now, but over 500,000 images available at the highest possible resolution within that, uh, within that environment. Designed for you, I mentioned Kathy Sierra. A commons is not about us boasting of our own glorious collections. A commons is humbly, humbly and selfish, self selflessly, humbly and selflessly about helping other people outside of our institutions accomplish meaningful work. Findable. I stock photo, the commercial stock photography site, does a spectacular job of helping me find visual resources, much better than most museum, library, and archive websites. Another standout, I think, is the industrial supplier in the States called McMaster Car. Findability. Shareable, it doesn't do you any good to find something, it doesn't do you any good to have rich, vast resources if you can't share it, if you can't do something with it. I think the design pattern of of expressing the shareability of content on every page is extremely important. Brooklyn Museum's website has sharing built into the platform 
from the beginning. Uh, reusable, again, Flickr, a standout in showing you everywhere you see resources that it's okay to reuse and under what conditions. Every page. Free, Lawrence Lessig, free resources are crucial to innovation and creativity. The Internet Archive says, like a library, we provide free access. The Powerhouse Museum, sometimes you need a lot of something to get a job done, to get work done. The Powerhouse Museum allows bulk download of their entire collection information system with one click. Very helpful. Sometimes you need to uh, data process on a lot of information. The data.gov site of the US government is built with machine readability in mind. Sometimes you need to uh, scan and ingest and sweep through information algorithmically. High resolution, I cannot overstress the importance of high resolution to people who need to do something. On NASA's website, you can download huge image files taken by the Mars rover and their other projects. You can get in so close you can see how the Mars rover's, rover's tires compacted individual grains of Martian soil. Also, I think the generosity of that gift from NASA makes me feel a bond with them that I don't feel if I have to click through 17 screens and assign an end user agreement before I get a medium resolution image. Um, collaboration without control. The uh, control collaboration costs of working through contracts and MOUs stifles almost all organizational uh, collaboration. I think the MIT Open Courseware is a great example of this, and Clay Shirky writes about this phenomenon, quote, we are living in the middle of a remarkable increase in our ability to share, to cooperate with one another, and to take collective action all outside the framework of traditional institutions and organization. Getting the free and ready participation work of a large distributed group with a variety of skills has gone from impossible to simple. So Clay argues that with collaboration without control, we can get work done in society that you used to need institutions for, but we can get it done often working together in our pajamas at home on our laptops for free. Um, MIT OpenCourseWare, I think, is a great example of collaboration without control. You see new classes being created all over the world using the raw materials of MIT OpenCourseWare. If those collaborations needed the legal uh, bespoke contracting process from MIT, they would never, ever happen. Network effects. The OpenStreetMap project has over, last time I checked, over 180,000 collaborators contributing geospatial information to this shared platform. The more people use it, the better OpenStreetMaps gets. The better OpenStreetMaps gets, the more people use it. It's a virtuous cycle made possible by network effects. The public domain, not some gummy residue left behind when all the good stuff has been covered by property law. The public domain is the place where we quarry the building blocks of our culture. That's, of course, is James Boyle. And after thinking about those 12 ideas for some number of months, I keep coming back to uh, a feeling that there's a 13th idea. Uh, and that 13th idea is trust, that design pattern. I often get asked, why don't we let Google do this for us? Why don't we let the private sector, Microsoft, anyone come in and take this burden of digitization and sharing and access off of our shoulders? And I think it comes down to trust. When we put something into a Smithsonian Commons, if we build that website, or when something goes into Europeana, we're asking the public to trust us. We're not going to sell your user ID to an advertiser. We're not going to try and sell you a discount mortgage in the States. We're not going to game our relationship with you. We're going to be honest and accountable for what we say about the world, and those promises are good forever. There are no other kinds of institutions in the world that I know of that can enter into those sorts of promises. Museums, libraries, archives are the places we go to for that trust, and that's why we have to build this commons ourselves. We can't delegate it to others. So, if I may, quickly show an example of what this Smithsonian Commons might look like if we actually build it. This is a movie we put together to help focus an internal conversation about the uh, possible consequences 
of this project. We have four movies. Uh, if you Google Smithsonian Commons prototype, you'll come up with this website and a link to all of the 1,200 and more public comments about this project. So this particular story is about an amateur astronomer. And brace yourselves for audio. Vast, findable, shareable, free. The Smithsonian Commons. A third of Smithsonian web visitors identify themselves as enthusiasts, lovers of art, nature, science, and history. This story shows how the Smithsonian Commons helps enthusiasts and citizen researchers to find and engage with Smithsonian resources. I work as an electrician by day, but I'm an amateur astronomer by night. I keep track of a lot of astronomy resources on the internet, and I have a blog where I keep in touch with friends and share what I'm working on. Every year I give a talk about astronomy at my kids' school, and this year I'm making them a web mashup that links the sky chart to photos and videos that explain celestial features. I've met a lot of great people through astronomy, and I want to contribute something back to the community. This amateur astronomer uses his phone to subscribe to a number of astronomy-related RSS feeds. This one is from the Smithsonian Commons. He's notified that there's a new picture in the Commons from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory's Chandra X-ray Telescope. On the Smithsonian Commons, he sees the image in the context of the whole Smithsonian, with links to deeper information. This is all real information, currently related on the Smithsonian topics. websites. Related topics is like a faceted search. Recommendations, including related exhibitions. Real exhibitions. Interviews with staff experts. Real interviews. And e-commerce opportunities. Real tchotchkes. Communities. Real comments. Most viewed items. And opportunities to participate and get involved. We want work on these grand challenges to be participatory, not something we do and you consume. Ask an expert, get involved, find an astronomy club near you, participate. The image and associated images are available in high resolution. Again, high resolution is so important for makers and users. And because he can clearly see the sharing rights associated with this picture, he knows that he has permission to modify, adapt, or incorporate this image into new works. He uses sharing tools to embed the photo in his own blog. This is my effort to explain embed codes, embed tags to uh, people who've never used the web before. Like many websites, the Smithsonian Commons provides an application programming interface, or API that lets him automatically link Smithsonian images to the star chart mashup he's making for his children's school. Star viewer for the crowd. I didn't even know you could do a Google Sky mashup, but you can. It's like Google Maps for space travelers. And this is all content that I found on the internet related to what we do, but currently not enabled by Smithsonian websites. This is our amateur astronomer's homepage on the Smithsonian Commons. He's personalized it to help him keep track of what he likes and what he's done. He's an avid Smithsonian Commons user with a strong reputation in the community. And his input broadens the reach and impact of the Smithsonian's primary resources and expertise. I think the... The Smithsonian Commons is free to use and join, but by creating a unique and compelling resource, the Commons encourages repeat visits, which should result in increased donations, purchases, and sponsorship revenue over time. Here we're talking about the money. So causes he's supporting, we're, we're celebrating his current support for our projects. We're giving him opportunities to buy. We're uh, um, reserving space for sponsorships and supporters. By encouraging the use of Smithsonian data beyond the walls of the institution, and by embracing the energy and intelligence of our visitors, the Smithsonian Commons creates a virtuous cycle of interaction and learning. I think the virtuous cycle is a big part of it, and I think also understanding that access, use, 
reuse and community are inseparable is the other key pattern of making a commons. I'll quit there. Thank you very much. <laughs>